Hello, people. It is Sunday morning. Not too early. I think it's like 9 o'clock. But I was almost done with this book, so I went ahead and finished it. So, yes, I have finished the book. The Voyage of the Armada, the Spanish Story. And they call it the Spanish Story because of uh, a lot of documents that have come to light. Uh, this fucking crazy Spanish king... You know, he saved all his documents, and, and they, they really just recently, like in the last 50 years or so, discovered this treasure trove of letters and orders and documents. When I first picked this up, I, I got this at, at the new bookstore, what I'm calling the new bookstore. It, it's another uh, used bookstore. It's much closer to the house, but it's very small. When I first pick, picked this up, uh, I thought, I really thought it was going to be another account of Trafalgar. But this is way before Trafalgar. This takes place in 1588. And this fucking crazy ass Spanish king, uh, Philip. Uh, there's a lot of crazy things going on in Europe at that time. Uh, Philip has this idea that he wants to. He wants to take over England. He, he feels like he has a claim to the throne of England. And he also wants to rescue the poor Catholics that are in England that are being uh, mistreated by the Protestants. Uh, there's a lot of that that goes on. I think the Thirty Years' War was, was the same thing. Uh, so he he amasses this Armada. There's 130 ships. They're in Madrid, I believe. Uh, no, it's not Madrid. It's somewhere, somewhere there in Portugal, because they had recently taken over Portugal. They sit there and they sit there. Orders are going back and forth. Unbeknown to any of them, the food that they have on board is already getting spoiled. They're supposed to sail up the English Channel and rendezvous with this guy Parma. I don't think Parma's even his name. He's the Duke of Parma. He is in the Netherlands where Spain holds territory and there's the, 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 the Dutch and the people from present-day Belgium are waging a guerrilla war against the Spaniards it is not going well for the Spaniards. But but this armada is supposed to sail there. Rendezvous with Parma. And Parma is supposed to load soldiers onto the onto the ships. He's also supposed to have rafts that are ready to carry more soldiers over to England. Uh it was just a crazy impossible scheme. The king orders this, the duke. The admiral that was supposed to lead this thing dies while they're, before they even leave. So he appoints this duke to, uh, to lead the thing. The duke pleads with the king not to make him do it. He's not a military man. He's never even been at sea. But, but the king makes him do it. The, the guy actually... Does as well as he can with 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 an impossible task. Uh, the Duke and and this other guy Parma never even succeed in talking to himself. Parma is there conducting negotiations with the English, unbeknown to anybody in the Armada. Uh, he builds his boats, but uh, not seriously. It's just for show. Uh, it's crazy. It was a wonderful book. I started it Thursday night, and I finished it today. Today is Sunday. I got quite a bit of notes here. The book is 247 pages, written in 1981. This is a first edition, which is nice. It's a little raggedy. Uh, 130 ships, we already talked about that. It's May through September 1588. This is a time when navies are undergoing some changes. The Spanish 
still have galleys that are oared vessels. Some are, are combos where they have sails and, and oars. Some of the shot that they bring is, is stone. And at, at the end of this, they're, they're comparing the damage done to the English fleet and, and the Spanish fleet. And it turns out that uh, the Spanish, uh, their stuff that was made of iron was, was faulty anyway. Uh, I learned that the Philippines were named after this crazy, stupid Spanish king. Uh, Catholic versus Protestant, we already talked about that a little bit. The Replacement Duke, second paragraph, page 53. You're going to have to suffer through this because i got a little bit of reading to do here. Uh, in general, however, there are two things one can say with certainty about these men. They were no fools, and their courage was beyond question. Stupid mistakes were made in preparing their armada and in its strategic plan, but once it was at sea, its commanders made no mistakes at all. If you were going to blame anybody about what happened to these ships and these people, it would be the king, and it would also be this guy, Parma. Uh the English versus Spanish ship design and tactics. The Spanish and the French also, as late as Trafalgar, they wanted to engage enemy ships and board. Uh, the English were not set up to do that. They didn't have soldiers. Uh, they had some, probably. But the Spanish ships were in command of soldiers, where the English ships were not. Uh, the English ships wanted to lay off and sink the Spanish with gunfire. Uh, even in Trafalgar, the, the, the Spanish and French aimed for the rigging. They aimed for the rigging so that they could slow the ship down, get next to it, and board it. Uh, second paragraph, page 70. There was a lot more I could have... Could have uh, read in this. This is a wonderful little book. This is the kind of book that I really like. Just zeroed in on one thing, on one incident. Oh, this is a long paragraph. To be at sea with contrary winds and command of 30,000 men with uneatable food and undrinkable water. This was a nightmare not even the Duke could have dreamed. He did not lose his head or his determination to do his un unwelcome duty. He had begged the king to send more food, but had not relied on him and had made his own arrangements with the local governor. His advisers had begun to press him to put into Corona for fresh supplies, but he was reluctant to do that for fear, he said, that the soldiers and sailors would desert as usual. As usual was the phrase he used, but to enter a Spanish harbor again, now that the soldiers had seen what life at sea could be like, would surely have tempted them far more than usual. I'm just going to stop there. Uh, this is only three weeks later after they left their original port. They had to put into another Spanish port because all their food and water was, was shit. They couldn't use it. Second paragraph, page 93. With this new one pre prestige, English captains began to express their own opinions about the Queen's ships of war. The new one prestige is, is something that Drake had won for the, the English in that uh, the sailor, the captain of the ship, was in charge of the ship. No matter what rank any army personnel that were on the ship, the captain was in charge. They did not like them. What they wanted was a kind of ship that would be a sailor's weapon, not merely a floating fort for soldiers. They evolved the concept of fighting at sea, which was revolutionary, to give up the age-old idea of grappling and boarding, and instead to fight at a distance and then rely entirely on their guns. So they would get rid of two encumbrances, the soldiery and its castles. The ship could be built with only one aim, to sail as well as knowledge of the art permitted, it was the most daring innovation ever made in navies. And when they say it's castles, they're talking about 
the houses at the back of the ship and at the front of the ship, which were used to house soldiers who could throw missiles at, at the ships they were getting near to. The Spanish ships had these castles, and you couldn't swivel them around so that you could sail against the contrary wind. The, the Spanish ships were, were, they were, they were totally unfit for going against the wind. This armada sailed up the English Channel. It got to Calais, and there was the last battle, and, and that was the one where the English actually sank some of the, the Spanish ships. And then there was another storm, and it could not go back down the channel. They had to go all the way around Scotland, Ireland, and England to get back to Spain. It's amazing that any of them did. There was 130 to start with, and you know various lists that say what happened at the end. They say approximately 65 ships returned, and, and that's just amazing. Uh, bottom of 202 to 203. And this idiot, Philip, he tried this again, twice more before he died. Two o two to two o three. That's another long one. But his worst worry was not navigation; it was food and water. They thought they had left Corona with eighty or ninety days' supply. Since then, they had been at sea for twenty-one days, and from such inquiries as the Duke could make, the Corona estimate looked far too optimistic. At the best guess, the voyage ahead might take a month, and to make the food and drink last so long he had to put everyone, of every rank, on a starvation ration right away. Half a pound of biscuit, a pint of water, and half a pint of wine a day. To save water, which was the worst worry of all, they threw overboard the horses and mules they had brought for the land artillery. One wonders why they did not eat them. A merchant ship that crossed the Armada's track reported the sea full of animals, still swimming. <laughs> this is after the last battle, when they, they're, they're trying to figure out what the fuck they're going to do. And they, they finally figure out that they have to go all the way around, all the way around the, the English islands. And then, it's just insane. Uh, second paragraph, page 244, and that's it. I'm going to put this one on the shelf, and I have another book. I'm going to stick to the wooden ships here for a little while. The Duke had written to the King as soon as he arrived. The, the Duke is one of the guys that gets back, uh, begging to be relieved of his command and the new responsibility he was too sick to assume. The king let him go. For all his faults, the king seldom withdrew his trust from a man he had bestowed it on, and he seemed to accept the duke had done his best. Whether any man could have done better was besides the point, for the task had been impossible. The faults of the armada were technical, not human. The duke, without question, had been loyal, intelligent, and brave, and had commanded his difficult officers with discretion and grace. <clears throat> He left Santander on 10th October to be carried on a horse litter the whole length of Spain to his home in San Lucar. There with his family he recovered, but it was said it was spring before he could ride around his estates again, and it is doubtful whether he ever recovered his spirit. It was a fantastic book. The author is David Howarth. Howarth. I'm sure I've read something by him before. Uh, in fact, I believe I've read uh, uh, Waterloo books by him. Uh, thanks for watching.